I love a good mystery. And that's one thing that internet is not short on. However, it's hard to find the truth behind a mystery. With so many posts and videos dramatising events, exaggerating accounts, and often just fabricating the entire story, it's tough to get to the bottom of a mystery to either debunk it or confirm its validity. That's what I've tried to do with this video. This mystery is almost 200 years old and is about a lad that suddenly appeared as if from nowhere and whose origin story is as mysterious as his sudden appearance. Hi folks, I'm Johnny and welcome to The Oddest. Let's take a wee look at the strange mystery of Caspar Hauser. On the 26th of May, 1828, the people of what is now Nuremberg, Germany, were going about their lives when a stranger would arrive in the town square. People noticed the boy looked like a pauper. His clothes were tattered, and despite being a teenager around 16 years old, he seemed to walk like a toddler. He was also seen squinting at the sun and appeared to have some aversion to light. Despite the boy's appearance, he had in his possession an embroidered handkerchief with the initials KH stitched onto it. He was also adorned with an expensive silk scarf, which draped loosely around his neck. In his hand, he was clutching an envelope that contained two letters, one of which was meant for a particular person. And this is where our story really begins. It wasn't long before the police approached the lad. Like I said, he was dressed like a pauper. His shoes were worn to the point where it was difficult to walk in them, and his jacket and trousers had holes. The strange teenager didn't say much to the police, although this was not because he didn't want to. He simply couldn't. He handed the envelope to the police officer. However, this just puzzled him more. The note was addressed to the captain of the 6th Cavalry, Captain von Wessenig. The letter was not written by the boy, but someone else. The anonymous author said in the letter that the boy was surrendered to his custody as a baby back in 1812. Since then, the author had raised the boy, taught him how to read and write, taught him about religion, but never let him take a single step out of my house. The letter went on to say that the boy had aspirations of becoming a cavalryman like his father, and that the captain was free to either take him in or hang him. The letter also said that the author was forced to send the boy on his travels to Nuremberg alone because if he accompanied him, then this would surely cost him his life. The police took him to the local police station to try and make sense of it all. The young man was given a piece of paper and told to write his name, which he did, Caspar Hauser. Despite being 16 years old, his mannerisms and behaviour, as I said, was that of a toddler. Whenever anyone spoke to him or asked him any type of question, he would either simply not answer them or he would just repeat the same words back. After a while, it would become apparent that Caspar at least possessed a normal level of intelligence. Once he relaxed in people's company, he would be able to talk more openly. He would tell his origin story, where he came from and how he arrived in the city. He would go on to say that until recently, he was never allowed outside. This pretty much mirrors what his guardian wrote on the letter. He said that he was raised in a room much like a prison cell and that it was so small that he was unable to stand upright in the room. This was the reason for him walking like a toddler. He also claimed that he had never actually seen the man who had raised him or it would seem held him captive. He claimed that he was never allowed to look at him and would often be blindfolded. Hence, his aversion to light. He said even when he was brought to Nuremberg, his captor kept him blindfolded the entire time. After word got around of the strange lad's arrival and unique situation in which he found himself, a local schoolmaster, George Dahmer, agreed to take the boy in. Caspar certainly acted like he was held in captivity. At one point, when shown his own reflection in a mirror, he freaked out and tried to grab at the stranger looking back at him. He just couldn't comprehend it. Even more strange, he didn't know what a flame was. When he was presented with a candle, he was amazed and burnt himself trying to grab the flame. The mystery would only deepen when it was discovered that he was unable to eat food. Well, he was able to eat food, of course, but he simply preferred simple bread and water. 
and pretty much refused to eat anything else, often gagging on anything that wasn't his preferred diet of bread. The more Caspar interacted with people, the more he would open up about the details of his strange life. He would talk of a memory that he had, although he wasn't sure if it was in fact a memory or simply a recurring dream. In this dream memory, he would be in a large castle and he would make mention of a very tall man with a sword dressed all in black. He also spoke of a pretty woman wearing a beautiful long dress. As you can imagine, it wasn't long before Casper became something of a local celebrity and piqued the interest of many people and scholars whose main focus was to try and unravel the true origins of the mysterious Casper Hauser. One of the most popular theories is that the boy was nothing more than a simple con man, a vagrant or a nomad that could spin a good yarn. Although this may well have been the case, there were just too many elements to say otherwise. There was another interesting theory that Caspar was actually the son of Grand Duke Carol von Baden and Stephanie de Beauharnais. This would make Caspar a lost prince. Under the care of the schoolmaster, Caspar began to flourish. He would be able to write without too many problems and became something of an artist and he loved to draw. Until 1829, when things started to go a bit pear-shaped for poor old Caspar, as it would appear that whatever his true origin story was, it was coming back to haunt him. Just before dinner one evening in 1829, Dormer grew impatient waiting for Caspar to appear for dinner. After searching the boy's room to no avail, he continued searching the rest of the house and would eventually find Caspar in the basement. The boy seemed flustered, startled and afraid. He was also sporting a fresh cut across the front of his forehead. When asked what happened, Caspar would say that he was attacked by a man wearing a hood. However, Caspar knew the man's voice and identified him as his captor. Caspar said that the man told him, you will have to die ere you leave the city of Nuremberg. A few months later, another similar incident would take place. Whilst the schoolmaster had guests at the house, the people were startled to hear a gunshot coming from upstairs. As the small group ascended the stairs and entered Casper's bedroom, they found him laying on the floor with yet another head wound. Beside him was a pistol. Casper would claim that he was standing on a chair in order to reach a book from a high shelf. He lost his footing and as he fell he grabbed a pistol which was hanging on the wall nearby, causing it to go off. Okay. Whether everything Casper was saying was true, or whether he was nothing more than a wee attention seeker, one thing was true, he was a problematic house guest for sure. This meant that he would be moved from house to house and host to host. His next caretaker would be a dude called Lord Philip Stanhope. He was a British nobleman who took a keen interest in helping Casper and would spend a great deal of money doing so. Stanhope noticed that Casper could speak a few words in Hungarian, so he paid for himself and the boy to travel to Hungary in an attempt to trace his origins there. Along the way, Casper would tell Stanhope that he was sure he was of Hungarian heritage and in fact he may well be the son of a Hungarian countess. However, this endeavour proved fruitless and nonsense. After a while, Stanhope started to doubt the boy's stories and credibility, as did almost everyone else. He was then transferred to Ansbach, 25 miles southwest of Nuremberg, into the care of yet another schoolmaster by the name of Johann Meyer. This didn't go very well for Caspar either. Meyer quickly developed the opinion that Caspar was full of crap, that he was vain and deceitful. Lord Stanhope had promised Caspar that he would return for him and the pair would then travel to England. This gave Caspar some hope and he looked forward to travelling overseas. However, Stanhope would later write, It is my duty, openly, to confess that I had been deceived. Caspar learned that he would never be going to England and his behaviour would grow worse. In December of 1833, he burst through the front door clutching his chest. He had been stabbed. He said that he was in the court gardens when a stranger stabbed him after handing him a strange bag. The police were called and after inspecting the area, sure enough, they found the bag in which Caspar had described, and inside it was a note. The note was written in reverse handwriting. Only after presenting the note in front of a mirror would the reader be able to decipher it. 
Hauser will be able to tell you quite precisely how I look and from where I am. To save Hauser the effort, I want to tell you myself from where I come. I come from the Bavarian border, on the river. I will even tell you the name, MLO. Needless to say, there were a few details about this attack that seemed dodgy. For example, it was snowing that day, yet there were only one set of footprints leading to and from the attack spot. These footprints belonged to Caspar Hauser. The letter was also folded in a unique way, corner to corner. Although this was a strange way to fold letters, there was one person that always folded letters that way. Caspar Hauser. There was also a few grammatical errors in the written note, errors that Hauser often made when he was writing. Things were looking even more dodgy for our wee Caspar. Three days later, Caspar Hauser would die of his wound. It's believed that he simply stabbed himself. He knew he wasn't garnering the same attention that he originally was, and it's thought that in an effort to revive interest, the wound was self-inflicted. However, he failed to realise just how deep the knife went. Even after his death, people still wanted to unravel the mystery of Caspar Hauser. Earlier in his story, I mentioned a theory that he was the son of the Grand Duke von Baden. Well, it was believed that he could well have been. It was alleged that as a baby, Caspar was removed from his royal home and switched with a dying infant. This would prevent the only male heir inheriting the title. If you have a wee look at his supposed parents, you can definitely see a resemblance, right? In 1951, letters were published from the House of Baden. In these letters, the Grand Duke's mother wrote in great detail about the birth and death of the infant boy, thus putting the claims that Hauser was of royal descent to bed for good. Caspar was buried in a local cemetery. His headstone reads, Here lies Caspar Hauser, riddle of his time. His birth was unknown, his death mysterious. 1833. Here you can see a statue of him in the centre of Nuremberg, where he first appeared. It's been almost 200 years since Caspar Hauser first appeared in Nuremberg. Since then, historians have pretty much debunked the idea that he was of royal lineage, through public records and the letters that were released. But here's the thing. People lie. If only DNA testing was available back then, then we'd know for sure, right? Well, in 2002, that's just what happened. A DNA test was performed on hair and skin samples from Hauser's clothes. Tune in next week for the results. No, I'm just kidding. So the DNA taken from Hauser's clothes proved with 95% accuracy that Hauser was the Prince of Baden. I know, right? The only way to be 100% sure would be to test the DNA of Stephanie de Boigny, or indeed the child that supposedly replaced Hauser. However, as of right now, the official stance is that the House of Baden does not allow any medical examination of the remains of Stephanie de Boarnay, or of the child that was buried as her son in the family vault. So that's it for this video, folks. What's your thoughts on this strange mystery? I love a good mystery. Right, I'm away for some tea. Take care of yourselves, and remember, keep smiling.